Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Schaus & Associates in our Get Far Sighted 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR Federal Acquisitions Regulations is the rule book that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We'll post all the recordings on our website and YouTube channel where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And a bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market, market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can be also can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Frank McNally. You can find his contact information on the screen. Today we are covering FAR Part 2 with Frank. Thank you, Frank, for joining us today. We are thankful for, the, for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours. Yeah, Please pleasure. let me know when you are ready for your next slide. Thanks, Arnav. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, I've uh, caught my breath after this morning's session. I don't know how many of the folks on the line now joined us for Part 1, uh, Federal Acquisition Regulation System. Um, for the next 45, 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about Part 2 of the FAR, which is definitions of words and terms. <clears throat> so we can go on to the to the next slide here. Uh, so I, I this is a really neat part of the FAR. Um, it's got all the definitions for all the terms. Um, and if you if you joined us this morning or for our session in December uh, about sort of the construct of the FAR, I think it's always a good place to start. Uh, so as you know, the FAR exists to uh, help govern the close to half a billion dollars in discretionary spending that the government is responsible for um, each year. Uh, and uh, it's codified in chapter one of Title 48 of the Code of Federal Regulations, and it's structured um, pretty elegantly, I might add, uh, into eight subchapters, uh, 53 parts, uh, numerous subparts, sections, subsections, paragraphs, and subparagraphs. So that's always a good place to start, I think, when we get into any of this. Um, <clears throat> uh, on to the next slide. Um, you can see here some, some screen grabs from the uh, FAR product that uh, uh, a, a small team of, uh, of FAR nerds and I developed called Open the FAR, OpenTheFAR.com. Um, it's, uh, in our opinion, just a, a cleaner uh, user experience. Anybody who's out there lamenting the loss of the Hill Air Force FAR site, uh, we welcome you over and open the far.com. Um, it's a free tool that'll help you navigate uh, the regs uh, in a little cleaner of a manner. Uh, I think our second release should be coming out really soon where we'll be able to take notes on particular parts of the FAR um, that you can kind of save for perpetuity. Uh, we want to do other things like annotations um, down, down the way. Uh, but for now, we're serving a cleaner experience of the FAR. Um, and uh, and you can see today we're going to be talking about part two, which is the definitions of words and terms. Uh, not many um, subchapters or sub, not many subparts in this particular part, uh, but a lot of pages. And we're going to see why. Uh, on to the next slide, please. All right. Um, a good quote here to get us started out. Uh, apropos, too, because I've heard this, uh, this movie, the Little Lemon movie, is supposed to be phenomenal. Um, I like good, strong words that mean something. That's some Louisa May Alcott. Uh, that pretty much puts it an underline under everything that we're going to talk about today because the FAR <clears throat> has, it's, 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 it's a, a regulatory document. It's got legal implications and the words, there's no accidental words in the FAR. If you can believe it, 10,000 pages. Not one accidental word. Every single word means something. And we have to know how to interpret it, how to apply it, 
and then how to basically use it for discretion, judgment, uh, decision making. So, uh, so the FAR has to have definitions because it's not intuitive all the time what a particular word means, uh, and it's not necessarily a dictionary definition of what a term means. So um, what we have to do is understand that, uh, that, that what a de an intended definition is, uh, and so that's what we're going to focus on today. On to the next, please. All right, so how are words defined in the FAR? Um, well, there's, there's three basic ways that, the, that a word would be defined in the Federal Acquisition Regulation. The first is in the definition that would be found in subpart 2.1. Fortunately, it is alphabetical. Um, but that's about it. Um, that's about the only construct in, in sec, uh, subpart 2.101, specifically section 2.101. So that's where you'll find the definitions generally. Now, words can also be defined in individual parts of the FAR uh, or subparts. Um, so that's the second way that words are defined. The third way is the context in which the word or term is used, okay? So sometimes we have to in, in, uh, infer what a, a word means if it's not defined anywhere else. If you cannot define a term uh, using those three um, ways above, you should consult a legal dictionary. I've always heard Black's Law Dictionary is the, uh, the, the dictionary of choice. Um, that's how you would define a term that's not defined in those three ways above. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so all of our definitions in the FAR are contained, like I said, in section 2.101, and you can see there that's uh, where it starts and open the FAR. And then you can also see on the on, on a slide on the right, a screen grab, um, where uh, an instance where a part of the FAR has its own definitions. This is part 15, contracting by negotiation. Many, many definitions in FAR part 15. It's my favorite part of the FAR. Uh, yes, I have a favorite part of the FAR, uh, and also um, probably one of the most intense sections of the FAR. So <clears throat> lots of terms um, get defined in there that uh, in some cases are, um, uh, you know, over um, or supersede the definition in Section 2.101. So let's, let's talk about that really quickly because that's an important distinction on the next slide. So how do we define how? This is not where, but this is how do we define words um, that are used in the FAR. The, the first thing to do if you come across a word that you're unfamiliar with or you'd like to get clarity on is you look up the term in section 2.101. Um, <clears throat> chances are it's defined there. Um, if, uh, if it is defined there, good, read that definition, understand it. Um, if it's not defined there, uh, you might need to look in your particular part. So, and if you are in a particular part of the FAR, and uh, you found that that the word you're um, you're trying to learn about is is defined in section 2.101. It may also be defined in a particular part or subpart. If that is the case, if a word is defined in a specific far part, that definition supersedes any other definition in any other part of the far, but only for applications pertaining to that far part. So, what does that mean? A definition in part 15 of a word would not apply if that word were used in part 16 or part 14 or any other part of the FAR. Okay, you can read more about this in FAR subsection 52202-1. Uh, that's where specifically, and that's a clause, by the way, that you incorporate by reference into every contract um, that's over the simplified acquisition threshold. So, look it up in 2.101. Check to see if it's defined in the part you're in. If it is defined in the part you're in, that's what you're going to use for that particular contract action that you're working on, okay? All right, let's go to the next slide because um, that's kind of it for part two. To be honest, what I thought we could do is, uh, is I could take you on a tour of, of what I think are the top 10 most confusing definitions of the FAR. We'll talk about what they are, uh, and hopefully this will demonstrate and indicate to you why it's really important to understand the definition of terms. Uh, and these, uh, these were voted by myself. These are the top 10 Frank's most confusing definitions in the FAR. So let's start with number one, assisted acquisition. Okay, what is an assisted acquisition? Well, it's a type of interagency acquisition where one agency, the servicing agency, performs a contracting action on behalf 
of another agency, the requesting agency, usually for a fee. Um, this is different than a direct acquisition where an agency can place an order against another agency's vehicle. The most common type of a di di direct acquisition that you might be familiar with is a GSA scheduled purchase. You, if you're not in GSA, let's say you're in Homeland Security, wherever you are, if you're buying off the GSA schedule, your agency doesn't administer the GSA schedule, GSA does. So you're performing a direct acquisition, but you don't need GSA's help with that. Okay. There are some times, however, where you might need assistance. So if you're using NASA Soup or if you're using another type of contract, I don't actually know NASA Soup is a great example, but um, just for purposes of illustration, that you might go to an agency and say, like NITAC, I think. NITAC does assisted acquisitions where, where you can go to them and say, you know what, I need this, I think, telecommunication support or whatever it is. Uh, here are my requirements. They'll go out, they'll use their own resources, and they'll return a contract for you. You're going to say, pay a fee. Okay. You can learn more about this in subsection 17.502-1. All right. Number two, our second most confusing definition in the FAR. This is a bit like a Casey Kasem countdown. I don't have the voice for it, but I do have the um, the nerddom for it. So, okay. So, definition number two, bundling, a form of contract consolidation that takes opportunities away from the small business community. That's what bundling is. It occurs when two or more requirements or supplies or services previously provided or performed under separate smaller contracts are combined into a single contract action. That's what bundling means. Um, a little bit more uh, goes into that. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're curious, go to section, I'm sorry, subsection 7.107-3 and learn all about bundling, but effectively, what that means is you're putting, let's say you had a couple different contracts uh, for, you know, supporting a program and they're all done, you know, because they're lower dollar value, they're all able to be done by uh, small businesses and you decide, hey, I don't need to do that anymore. I'm going to consolidate all of these um, under one contract and, and go to a big systems integrator. Well, you can't necessarily just do that. Um, and if you do, you, uh, you might have to get a determination and findings memorandum signed or you might have to do some type of prerequisite activity to permit you to bundle. And usually that involves uh, going to the Small Business Administration, working with your OSDABU, your Office of Small and Disadvantaged uh, Business Utilization to, to ensure that it's, it's appropriate to bundle at that time because you're taking opportunity away from the small business community. Okay, so that's bundling. Definition number three, <clears throat> commercially available off the shelf hot products, okay? This is important. It's not simply a commercial item. Okay, cost is not just a cost. To qualify as cost, the item must be sold in substantial quantities on the commercial market and be offered to the government in the same form that it is sold commercially. The example I always use to describe um, cost products uh, is a Humvee, okay? So the Humvee that your brother-in-law with the frosted tips drives to the mall on Saturday morning is not a cost product because that Humvee is different than the Humvee that your brother-in-law, the veteran, drove in Afghanistan. That's a completely different vehicle, okay? Yeah, it's the same basic idea, it's a Humvee, but it's not the same thing. So Humvees aren't cost products. Humvees are actually, uh, I think, developmental uh, products because there's a, a good degree of aftermarket um, update to armor the vehicles, to do all kinds of things that the DOD determines are necessary. Shout out to Frosted Tips, by the way. The early 2000s were an amazing time. Okay, so that's commercially off the shelf. COTS items, they're not just commercial items. They have these two particular qualification points, um, and that's important to know. You can also read more about this in section 12.103. Okay, number four, us or pricing data. Okay, all right. <clears throat> now, us or pricing data is simple. It's really just all the facts that a prudent buyer would reasonably expect to affect price negotiations significantly. That's about as simple that it, as it gets, okay? So <clears throat> cost and pricing data um, can be derived from a lot of different inputs. Vendor quotes, non-recurring costs, information on production, on production methods or purchasing volumes, business projections, cost trends, make or buy decisions, estimates, management decisions, 
Those are all the types of things that can inform cost or pricing data. Now, you might be shaking your head and going, you're wrong. Uh, no, actually, so certified co cost or pricing data is something different. Okay, so certified cost or pricing data, that's an entirely new definition. If I put one word in front of there, certified, I create an entirely new definition. <clears throat> and that definition is um, covered in section 2.101. So there's, there's cost or pricing data, that's defined. There's also certified cost or pricing data, that's defined as well. And, and basically the distinction with certified cost or pricing data means that they were submitted in accordance with section 14, I'm sorry, section 15.403 uh, under um, formal source selection. Um, we cannot ask for certified cost of pricing data when we're buying commercial items. We cannot ask for certified cost of pricing data when we're working with small businesses. Um, however, we need to use, sorry, the certified cost of pricing data. We need to use basic regular old cost of pricing data when we're making award decisions, but know that that's different than certified cost of pricing data. Okay, that's probably clear as mud. Um, so I'd recommend going out, reading those definitions, those two definitions in section 2.101, and then to learn a little bit more about certified cost or pricing data, go have a gander at section 15.403. Did I just say gander? I think I did. All right, next slide, please. It is the 20s after all. Um, okay, task versus delivery orders. Um, a delivery order is physical products or goods. I, the way, I mean, it's basically, these terms are interchangeable and nobody's gonna get fired if they call a task order or delivery order and vice versa but you know it's kind of a distinction so a delivery order is a physical product or good right if it's delivered to me it's tangible it's an item it's got to be sent to me at the delivery order if it's services that are provided it's a task order okay both of them are funding orders that are placed against a parent vehicle like an idiq or even a, a blanket purchase agreement okay so delivery versus task order yes yeah, I think that's confusing. I got confused about it, so I included it in my top 10. It's my top 10. Um, see also section 16.505 if you want to know a little bit more about delivery versus task orders, okay? So now I got a doozy for you. Let's go on to the sixth most confusing definition in the FAR. Discussions versus exchanges versus clarifications. Oh boy. These terms pertain to communicating with prospective offers However, there's a very crucial distinction when we're using part 15. Okay, so let me see if I can just keep this straight. Okay, discussions occur before a pro proposal has been submitted. If you're talking with a, um, a vendor uh, during the period between uh, a solicitation being released and prior to it being awarded, you are conducting discussions. Now, discussions are important. Discussions, you know, if you're disclosing certain things in those discussions, you may have the obligation to disclose them to all of the people uh, that are in party to the contract. And so that's why you'll often see um, 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 Q and O, sorry, uh, uh, amendments to the solicitation get issued. Um, sometimes that can occur when a discussion takes place and, and the contracting officer determines that information that's material to the, to the contract award has been, has been divulged and needs to be released to everyone. Okay, so, but the important point is discussions occur before proposals have been submitted. Exchanges, on the other hand, occur after proposals have been received and are typically uh, things that, that um, are done in the course of negotiating a contract uh, and typically done with folks that are in the competitive range. Okay, so exchanges after proposals have been received, discussions before proposals have been received. Clarifications, on the other hand, because I mentioned exchanges usually deal with, with contractors that are in the competitive range during an active negotiation, okay? Now, clarifications are limited exchanges. They do occur after the proposals have been received, um, but they are just used to clarify certain things about a proposal when the contracting officer intends to award without discussions, okay? So that means, you know, we're not going to negotiate much. We're really not going to, like, ask you to, you know, come up on something or reduce your price here, add a service here, like what, which we might be doing in a negotiation when pursuing best value. We're basically saying we just need clarification on a single part of your proposal. This is not a discussion. We just need a clarification on your proposal because we want to award without discussion. All right. That's 
a doozy. There's like entire contracting courses that, that pertain to part 15 and that you'll spend hours on discussions, exchanges, and clarifications. So there's some relevant sections there that you might want to take a look at, section 15.201, section 3.104, ethics, uh, and section 15.306, okay? Discussions, exchanges, clarification. On to number seven, FOB destination versus FOB origin. Freight on board, FOB. Hugely important when acquiring physical goods because it defines which party is liable for the condition of a shipment, okay? And it's, it's distinguished basically by when the seller is responsible, okay? So in FOB origin, freight on board origin, the seller of the product is only responsible for the items until they leave their warehouse or distribution center. Say that Once they go from their warehouse onto the delivery vehicle, seller can wash their hands, whatever happens, happens. FOB destination, on the other hand, requires the seller to, seller to be responsible for the product up to the point where they are unloaded to the buyer's delivery destination. Why is this important? Well, delivery um, is very material to product acquisition. So if you um, want to save money on your contract, uh, FOB destination is probably where you're going to be going because uh, you're not going to have to pay for additional logistics. Or you're going to have to pay your own your own delivery network, or you're going to have to arrange your own shipment, right? So FOB destination says, seller, you're going to deliver this. I know I'm going to incur a cost, but the upshot there is I don't have to be responsible for this thing until you ship it wherever it's going. Once I receive it, once I take ownership of it, FOB destination, now I'm responsible. If it arrives damaged under FOB destination, you got to send me another one. You got to fix it. You got to do whatever consideration is required to make that whole. With FOB origin, I'm probably not paying the vendor uh, for shipment. I'm using my own carrier, or I've got you know already have a delivery contract set up. Maybe if these are recurring items that we're purchasing you know often, and we have our own carrier set up. That carrier goes to the origin, goes to the warehouse, picks up the item, um, and if it's delivered to me damaged or uh, or faulty. Not the, fault, not the fault of the seller at that point, but damage faulty is a little different. But if it arrives damaged under FOB origin, not the problem of the seller, that's the problem of the delivery uh, contractor, whoever I'm using to, to deliver. So know that distinction, FOB origin versus FOB destination. You're going to come across this in just about every um, product uh, acquisition or delivery order that you deal with. And you can read more about that at section 47.303 or the clauses at subsection 52247-29 and 49. All right, Sec, uh, number eight here, um, GWAX versus MAX. All right, so all government-wide acquisition contracts, that's a GWAX, are multi-agency contracts or MAX. So all GWAX are MAX, but not all MAX are GWAX. This is another nuance of interagency acquisition. We talked earlier about assisted acquisition versus direct acquisition. Um, not that material, to be honest, but probably just pays to know the details. Uh, MAX, multi-agency uh, multi contracts, are federal supply schedules that are authorized by the Economy Act. GWAC, government-wide acquisition contracts, basically MAX for IT products, and they were authorized by the Clinger Cohen Act. Other than that, they basically operate the same way. So you'll hear these words used interchangeably. Um, and, uh, you know, if you hear somebody use them uh, interchangeably in the incorrect way, you can wink to yourself and know that you're smarter than that person. Okay. You can also read more about that at subpart 17.7. Definition number nine. We're getting close to midnight here. Um, inherently governmental functions. Big time. All right. So what is an inherently governmental function? It is one that is so intimately related to the public interest as to mandate performance by government employees. Now, this is a policy determination, not a legal one. That means that there is a degree of discretion that agencies have uh, in determining what constitutes inherently governmental functions within their contract activity. Okay, it's uh, typically guided by these two factors: a decision that requires either the exercise of discretion in, a, in applying government authority 
or the making of value judgments to make a decision on behalf of the government. We cannot and should not delegate those two things to a contractor. We need to make those on our own. Those are inherently governmental functions, inherently governmental decisions, inherently governmental actions. This is really important in services contracting, okay? If you've ever awarded a services contract, you've probably dealt with inherently governmental functions. You've understood whether or not the uh, services that you are acquiring meet this definition. In likelihood, they do not. But in some cases, they can. And it can be a little more nuanced um, than you might even think. So it's important to go ahead and give subpart 7.5 in acquisition planning a read to understand more about inherently governmental functions. Number 10. Multi-year versus multiple-year contracting. Now, this is a fun one. This is number 10 for a reason. It's not defined in Section 2.101. This distinction is actually defined in Section 17.104. Okay? Um, so, um, multi-year contracting is a method of acquiring known requirements for up to five years. Up to five years. That's the ordering period would be the entirety of the five years. And you can do this even though the funds may not be available at the time of contract award. Okay. So a multi-year contract uh, is basically can have like a five-year term. And uh, you may only have funding for like one year of that. In a multiple-year contract, on the other hand, this is your standard base plus type of contract. Uh, you have to have a funded base year. You actually have to have funding for whatever year of that multiple year contract you intend to award. Um, so you've got the base year, that's funded. You might have unfunded options, um, but they have to be unfunded for reasons. So that's not any type of obligation from the government's behalf to, uh, to exercise those options. Because if we did do that, if they were, uh, options were not at our discretion, we would be putting ourselves into a, a pickle with regard to Anti-Deficiency Act regulations, uh, in particular uh, ratifications. If you want to learn more about this, check out Section 17.104 and Subpart 17.2. Um, and that's I got through those a little quicker than I than I thought I would. Um, so we might give you a few minutes back here, but on the next slide, I do have five more. Um, of my favorite confusing definitions at our blog over at blog.openthefar.com. So if you want to know what things like, oh, organizational conflicts of interest, OCI, that's number 11 for me, um, organizational conflicts of interest. It's really important if you're in construction or architect and engineering services. Um, very relevant to know what OCI is. And if you're, by the way, if you're a contract out there working on, uh, if you're servicing agencies by helping them develop requirements, know that you may be OCI'd out of the follow-on contract, which is not that big of a deal because the money might be good, but you want to know about that definition. Number 12, statement of objectives, the SU, um, which to me is the pinnacle of federal contracting, the, the utmost um, point at which we are leveraging our innovation and discretion is the statement of objectives. Um, really super to use uh, for, for requirements documents that, that just want to state the overall performance objective of a particular solicitation. You should use a SUE whenever you want to give your experts in the contracting community the maximum flexibility to offer and propose innovative approaches. Um, the 13th one is termination for convenience versus termination for cause. Um, it's, uh, it's really false, right? False is the trigger here it's described in section 12.403. Um, I mean, by law, government can terminate a contract whenever it wants to um, for its convenience. Doesn't have to have a, a, it has any reason counts. Doesn't have to be a good reason. The government can terminate your contract for convenience anytime. Now, when they do, uh, which that is an unalienable right, by the way, of the government, when they do terminate for convenience, contractors out there, you know that you still might be entitled to get payment for work that you've been completed, and you also may be able to file for, for expenses um, where you can demonstrate that uh, those expenses arose 
because of the government's right to terminate for convenience. So termination for convenience, an unalienable right in government contracting can be done at any time and is very different from termination for default or cause, which you do not want to be a part of. If you're terminated for default, hello, uh, you're on the debarred list. That means you've done something really bad. Uh, you defaulted on a contract uh, and uh, it's a big deal. You failed to deliver, you couldn't, and you get, by the way, you get several chances to, to cure your failure or show a caution before you're de terminated for default. Um, but uh, if you are, you might be responsible for any remedies. You might have to pay the government. Uh, that's a lot more than taxes too. Uh, our 14th definition over on this blog is allowable versus unallowable costs. Um, <clears throat> there's an entire, entire uh, section of contracting uh, that deals with allowable versus unallowable costs. Um, and it's uh, section 31.205. Um, talks about selected costs, and then there's the whole FAR cost principles guide uh, that's a chronology of allowable versus unallowable costs. Um, so, you know, it basically pays to understand what allowable versus unallowable costs are. Um, then finally, number 15 on our, uh, on our de uh, guide to definitions of the, the ones that we think are the most confusing are unsolicited proposals. I bet some folks out there have, uh, have heard about unsolicited, maybe you received an unsolicited proposal, maybe you've thought about writing one. Uh, basically, it's a written proposal for a new or innovative idea submitted to an agency, um, but that's not in response to a request for proposal or broad agency announcement or cyber contract or topic or anything like that. Basically, you're just saying, hey, I think I have a really good idea for you know, doing something that you've observed the government needs to do. Here's an unsolicited proposal. Please read it. Um, they are, they do have to be handled in a certain way. Um, and in fact, FAR policy 15.602 encourages their submission. Um, but they do have to meet certain standards. Uh, they shouldn't be marketing material. You know, they actually have to uh, propose something useful. So anyway, uh, definitely worth studying up on uh, unsolicited proposals on both sides of the, the aisle, whether you're a contracting officer or a, or a vendor, you want to know kind of what those are all about, okay? So if you want to be the best trusted business advisor you can be, take a minute to understand FAR definitions, how they're used, um, how you define them, and where you can learn those definitions, and you'll be more aware of some of these confusing concepts in federal acquisition, uh, and you'll be really prepared next time someone asks a tricky question okay all right so that's far part two hopefully this was uh, an enjoyable way to spend 30 minutes of your friday uh, i appreciate uh, your attention and uh, jennifer and arnab i appreciate you having me on to uh, to do this part good luck the rest of the way 51 more to go you ready yep thank you so much for your presentation frank um it was really really appreciate it um to our audience members thank you again for participating with us uh, if you have questions about this part, please contact our speaker with the contact information you see on the screen. Um, and if you have any questions about uh, federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, this concludes today's webinar.